Vim, The Tale of Immortality by Dysylvania Episode 2 Seven Threads Oh, you're back. One might say the story had you hooked. What? What's wrong? Oh, the voice. It's different, but it's still me. I'm still your friendly book of recollections. So, do you like my new voice? Yes? No? Either way, you're stuck with it for the rest of this recap. Well, let's find out what happens next. I'm just as curious as you. You remember Genevieve, who touched the mysterious bubble simmering with light? Well, the moment she did that, her eyes sparkled with a mischievous gleam. The bubble merged with her, awakening a sense of cruelty, while Lucius, touching another bubble, absorbed newfound knowledge. Only Shack, which is short for Shackle Shack, the snake folk youngling, recognized these bubbles as Lumeno's earliest creations, shapeless souls known as the Fool's Flame, yearning for embodiment. Yet, the side effects weren't that bad, so they journeyed along. And when Hebdom and Lucius grew weary and their legs gave out, they set up camp. Genevieve showed off her culinary skills by cooking a delightful pastry, little fangs, filled with cheese and onion. The humans savored the nourishing food, which was a welcomed change to the daily bark and turnip soup. During the first watch, Shackle Shack and Genevieve got preoccupied with a wild rooster that appeared behind a forest shrub. Shackle Shack unexpectedly tried to protect the rooster from Genevieve's hunting instincts, revealing he had a soft spot for animals. As Shack and Genevieve settled down to sleep, the others woke to take their turn. Whilst on watch, they stumbled upon a wretched, barely clothed wanderer. Without hesitation, they offered him a baguette, carrots, and bark from their provisions. The stranger gratefully accepted and quickly vanished into the shadows from the same direction he had arrived. As the group huddled together to discuss their plan, they learned that the stolen parchment belonging to the Fairy tribe was a magical map made by Mercurius. But there was a catch. The map would only reveal itself when touched with a tear. But <laughs> you already knew that. In a moment of vulnerability, Gregory shed a tear on the parchment as memories of his dead mother flooded his mind. Six months before, the Fairy tribe raided Greenwell. Gregory remembered those horrid moments when the beasts ended his mother and stole her lifeless body. With tears in his eyes, the big man looked up. He saw Mercury, an astral who claimed Gregory to be one of her children, throwing her ethereal orange arms around him, showing connection and motherly empathy towards her child. Not long after, a connection between Shaq and Martis sparkled, and the Astral invited him to join the ranks of his warriors. As their watch continued, Hebdom's voice carried the weight of prophecy as he weaved the tale of the first six constellations. The Tome, the King, the Betrayer, the Builder, the Hunter, and the Two Ravens, determining the protagonists, themselves. The following two signs encountered, Father Time and the Grave, would mark the location. In the midnight forest, the journey would beckon them to descend into the Tomb of Time, the entry to the other world that is said to be guarded by the end of all things. A pivotal moment would be awaiting them there. The place marks the conjunction of magic, where seven threads bind the world in seven knots. In the middle, the Book of Vim, the source of magic would be stored, this book resembling a promise that could save their people. They talked and talked, and eventually they set out again. The map unfolded the path to Kronos Sanctum, the Tomb of Time, situated south at the meeting point between the Midnight Forest and the Green Forest. Following the trail, 
they encountered a sealed gate where Genevieve, in a surprising twist, became the living key. She unveiled her fangs, bit her palm and smeared blood over a circular, uneven symbol, magically opening the gate. They stepped into what seems to be a burial ground adorned with coffins, tombs and mausoleums. The statue of the Grim loomed over the eerie scene, but what beckoned to them were the chained down coffins. An odd precaution, wouldn't you say? As if to restrain those within from escaping. Curiosity led Shack Lashak to press an ear against a coffin. To his surprise, he heard the sound of deep breathing coming from within. Meanwhile, Genevieve, looking around the place a bit further away, discovered a mausoleum bearing the La Fevre inscription. What a strange coincidence, since Genevieve herself is a La Fevre. A glance towards her companions, making sure she was not being followed, and she entered, leaving the others outside to keep her family secrets away from strangers. Inside, she discovered a couple of tapestries depicting two scenes. First, a man holding a hidden object veiled by a cloth, enduring the bite of a vampire as his body was being drained of blood. The second, a garden of roses with a maiden and a small wooden home adorned with a beautiful chime behind her. As she skimmed through them, she realized they all talked of the purge carried out by Paolo Scamacca in order to eradicate the vampire race, making room for the holy, superior beings envisioned by Obscuro to serve the new faith. Genevieve retrieved two unusual objects from the tapestries, an enigmatic chime and an empty globe, seemingly devoid of any kind of power. Swiftly packing them, she inspected the ornate coffin adorned with roses and intricate designs in the center of the room. Opening the lid, she discovered a woman who resembled her in every way except for the ears. Genevieve had pointed ears, whereas the woman in the coffin did not. As Genevieve attempted to communicate with her grandmother, she slid one hand through the ethereal barrier enveloping the casket. In a whisper, she inquired what her father had done to her. Suddenly, the female vampire within shrieked, grappling Genevieve by the arm and slashing her wrist. The commotion alerted the party outside and they attempted to enter the mausoleum. Genevieve freed herself from her grandmother's grip, sealed the coffin and promised to return. Emerging just in time, she blocked her companions from entering. Assuring them she was well, she quickly consumed two blood-red potions, restoring her health. Guided by Kaith and the map, they reached a tomb with the inscription Power and Bravery. Shaq Shack and Gregory, known for their formidable strength, vigorously attempted to open it together. However, Gregory touched it first, being a tad quicker as his hand made contact with the tomb the grave branded him with a circular symbol that bore an uneven edge. Hmm, strange, don't you think, my dear audience? They walked further and further, and after hours, miles and miles underground, to arrive at the chamber under the dawn sky. In a surprising revelation, they realized that Keith was the rightful guide on the map. Above. Five astrals were aligned in red, orange, purple, green and indigo hues. Pedestals displayed hundreds of enchanted items, white gloves, a top hat, a red shield, a pair of golden axes, a golden peacock, a hammer, a tall glass, a pen and many more. A warning was etched into the stone, cautioning them against greed. Each party member took one item corresponding to the glimmer of a star. Keith claimed the shimmering gloves, Yarek chose the peacock, Gregory took a sturdy hammer, 
Hebdom selected the feathered pen and Lucius, coaxed and literally nudged by Shaq, reluctantly picked up the shield. As Genevieve selected a tall glass that shimmers blue, the moon rose above their heads, aligning with the astrals. Finally, when Shaq Le Shaq touched the golden yellow axes, the sun also emerged, aligning just the same. In the center of the room, a circular trapdoor adorned with silver edges drew their attention. Lucius, now enriched with the understanding of Primordial, deciphered the inscription on it. Upon opening the trap door, an ancient book emblazoned with the letters V-I-M appeared, cradled by seven vibrant, rainbow-glimmering strings and knots that held it in suspended tension. Underneath, a deep, dark, ominous water rested. They all attempted to untangle a knot each, which resulted in missteps from Lucius, Gregory and Shaq, triggering a rapid rise in the water level that soon flooded the room and broke the doorframe. The sudden gush of water divided the group into two, with Lucius, Yarek and Hebdom on one side and the rest on the other. As the knots got untied, Lucius got to hold the Book of Vim. That's the other Book of Vim. I'm only the Book of Recollections. No, I'm not jealous. Why would you think that? Martis appeared on Lucius's side. The Astral's voice boomed. Now! And a new series of events were set in motion. This was the recap for episode 2 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Count Bear, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons and Dragons campaign, Vim, the Tale of Immortality, tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash at Dicelvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us, and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite!